I'm excited to be here. Uh, I've been around Go since about like 2015 and always was really excited about like there's so much potential here. This is such a great language. I am a little biased. I came from a C++ background, so eventually I learned Go was written for people like me, but it really resonated. And uh, I've been at Capital One for almost nine years. And the very first project that I joined was a mainframe project where I was mostly doing those Java Bean applications that Aaron was bringing up, but we were even connecting those to COBOL, and that was the that was the first asset that I came in on. And since then, have seen the company try different strategies for how do you work with mainframes, how can we modernize them, and I want to share both how that works and like understanding how a large legacy type system operates, and then covering how you can use Go and the language uh, both from the technical standpoints and also the principles that are guiding it to build at that scale at your company. So this is a bit of an outline. To give a warning, if you thought you know you came to this Go conference and we were just going to talk about Go code, unfortunately, I'm going to be asking all of you to like really dig into like what is a mainframe, what are legacy systems, and like how do you hopefully learn some of these strategies? Because if you have not worked with modernizing legacy systems very often, uh, a lot of the Obvious answers that you will try <laughs> fail, uh, and I can I want to share that experience to hopefully help you. And then for those that uh, after you've kind of tried and you've potentially failed, what's going to work, and how do you how do you use it to build large teams that are going to tackle this problem ideally in Go? All right, so to kick it off, I'm going to assume not everybody really knows exactly what a mainframe is. If you do, if you've worked in mainframes, especially if you've written COBOL, I like absolutely want to talk to you. So please reach out in Discord. Uh, I'd love to share some experiences. But mainframes uh, were created 77 years ago. So that's when the first one launched, the Harvard Mark I. It was created by this guy, Howard. This is the original kind of squad that led the launch of this massive mainframe. And I've added here a picture that almost encapsulates the entire size of the mainframe. It's in fact 55 feet wide, so like much larger than my New York apartment, probably two of them side by side. Uh, but what this mainframe was for, is you can see at the very first section, this has a 30 down by 24 across set of switches. And there's actually two of them, so you've got 60. But those are all going to be used for tracking the values inside your mainframe. And what you can do is you can do up to 72 numbers, they can be 23 digits long, and you can do a bunch of math. So I've included some of the metrics, how fast you can do these math equations. And at the time, this was just absolutely mind-blowing. The uh, Howard, the guy who created this, was all over saying, this is it. We've solved this problem. There's going to be 24 entire mainframes used in the entire world, 24 or 27, something like that. He's like, that's it. We're going to do all of our math problems and you know, solve the world's problems. The second picture I want to show that I really like is this is a picture of the punch codes that they would put in to this mainframe system. And there were two things when I was like pulling up just some images around mainframes that stood out for this picture. So the first was I could really picture us at like conference talks today uh, if we did not write with human words and instead wrote in punch codes. I can totally picture the like slides and wave analysis of writing our code. And I think that would actually be a really fun exercise to do at some point in time. But second, something that's very um, not necessarily well known is there's the story of Grace Hopper and the mainframe team finding a bug in their system. And it was one of those, like, they couldn't figure out why it wasn't running. And eventually, they actually physically looked in that 55-foot mainframe and found a moth sitting inside. So from then on, whenever they had issues with their code, even if it was, in fact, their punch code, they would say, it's a bug. It's like, it's not me. With these pieces of paper, that were punched. Uh, eventually, you know, you're doing your calculations and you're running through all of them, and it doesn't take you long to say, like, I w I'm gonna, I want to run this again. I want to run this with different values, but I want it to be the same set of instructions. And so, what they ended up doing was they taped the paper back to itself, creating a loop that would run. And that's literally why we call it for loops today. That's why you reference, oh, you're going to run this code again in this loop interface. And it's just because we taped this paper back on itself. And so I just found that kind of fun and interesting to see how that terminology is absolutely what we still use today. But uh, the mainframes of right now are definitely not that like 55 foot monstrosity. So 
first of all, like 70%, I don't think everybody realizes just 70% of Fortune 500 companies are using mainframes. 90% of credit card transactions. I don't think this data is too old, a few years old. Just incredible volume of business uh, transactions go through mainframes. On the right, I've got this picture of like an IBM modern mainframe. They've got their like nice, looks more modern, it has the blue stripes. What's interesting and important to kind of know about these mainframe systems is I, there's 40 terabytes of memory on here. So what's compelling about mainframes is when you're building something in like the cloud, if you're using, I, I glanced at AWS sizes and in memory, the, the largest I saw is about half a terabyte. So when you're comparing half a terabyte of data to 40, you could have a very, very different conversation about how you're going to save your data and how you're going to make sure you have a consistent read. And if you can just dump like that, 40 terabytes is much larger than the entire volume of transactions that we are generally monitoring. Um, you can just put all memory and that's going to obviously make it so quick, so fast. So there's that speed that comes with mainframes that's really, really hard to beat. And then the final bullet that I just brought up because uh, it's actually a really fantastic read is that they have a fun fact where it, it definitely can survive at least an 8.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. And the reason they know that is because they absolutely created a like very serious test where they went rigorously through and like tested out these earthquakes with these mainframes. So you know it'll sit around forever. So this is a modern mainframe. Most companies are using something in between. Now I pulled on this slide. We know banking, people, you know, banking and governments tends to be where people think of mainframes. That's where they tend to bring it up. It's definitely everywhere in that uh, in these domains, but I added in a bunch of other ones, kind of just like threw in some names. I scanned like that link at the bottom. You can just pull it up, and there's a huge list of companies that IBM is tracking that use mainframes, and it's across all these industries. So there's also healthcare and insurance. There's probably some surprise around like most airlines are still using mainframes and are actually pretty passionate about, I think in the mainframe world, <laughs> they like really know what they're doing and have strong opinions. But you can see it all over the place. Even I added the New York Times uh, news more quickly than other industries, but it, it's just everywhere. So this is uh, to help essentially explain how mainframes are used today, where they came from, and all of that. Now, nine years ago, that's when I was introduced to mainframe development. And I joined a team uh, where we were tasked with, we've got multiple mainframes, and we want to merge two of them. That's a common strategy if you're working with legacy systems and you've got your data inside of them. You don't want to have tons and tons of different backends because things will get confusing. You've got to maintain all of them. So a natural um, request is to take all of these things and merge them. So how this kind of looks and how this came about, because I don't think many people would think this all through, is if you started a company in the 70s and 80s, you used a mainframe. Every single, it was the only option. You had a mainframe. And you had all these smaller companies, whether they were banks, insurance, whatever, uh, all backed by one mainframe. And then over time, you'll see companies merge. And so then they're left with this conglomerate of a bunch of different backends. And they are like, well, I don't, I don't want all these backends. <laughs> so the natural reaction is to say, just like, let's just start merging them. And that makes a lot of sense, in theory. Uh, I heard the project idea. I was like, yeah, sure, that, that sounds right. That's what we should do. I want to break from this like idea of this assumption that you're just going to merge these mainframes easily and talk a little bit more about like what actually is a mainframe. So I just added this GIF for two reasons. One, the guy is kind of fun. Uh, but two, if you look, so this whole stereotype of like hacking that you see in TV of the black screen with the green text comes from mainframes. But also the picture here, if you can see it, is not the most unrealistic. It's not actually showing you a mainframe, but it does really show a similar UI. Because this one, I just looked around at random pictures of mainframes. And this one I found, and I, this is something I worked with. Um, so you pull, you pull up a system and you're going to see this menu. It's going to have different options, but you're going to see this like, okay, select 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. This makes a lot of sense. You're like, no problem. Just going to, it's a terminal interface, not a big deal. Um, I kind of looked around and the second picture just kind of gives an example of when you're going through, it's not so much a clean flow 
of uh, like steps you're going to run through. It's actually pretty complex. Uh, you need to remember all of the characters you put through because eventually you're going to get to this like journal entry was what they've described it. I've seen that before. And you're going to want to update it. Maybe you want to change the balance. This isn't a testing environment, but you're going to update. You're going to want to refresh. You're going to want to run a batch, something like that. And I remember when I joined this team early on, it was a bunch of like very seasoned mainframe engineers and me, uh, like right out of college, and they were like, we don't know, we don't, like really nice to meet you, <laughs> uh, but have some fun with COBOL. And I started, I was primarily on the Java app, but we would run this batch. So every day you got to get the data over to the mainframe and back, even for testing. And eventually I kind of worked my way through so that I could run that by myself. And I figured all that out. Really proud. They were totally praising me. It was like, this is wonderful. You know, <laughs> we didn't expect this of you. They had much lower expectations of somebody coming in cold. And after a couple of weeks of this, maybe a month or two, I can still remember, you know those memories that are burned, like you know exactly where you were when this happened? This is one of those memories where one of the mainframe engineers walks up, real cheery, such a nice guy, and he's like, I think today you should write some COBOL. And like it was like every I froze like that whole meme of the woman with the math equations above her head. I just I'm sitting there like wait, and I'm trying to work my way backwards from like a, a real mistake that I made, and I, I quickly get there. But I in that moment was like, what do you mean I should write COBOL? <laughs> I was like, what what have I been doing? And now I don't say anything out loud, but I, I was able to trace like oh I'm just using a UI. That's very obvious. But the complexity of when you are working through trying to figure out what you want to update just through this UI actually feels so similar to programming that I didn't even realize. Like I wasn't actually doing anything. I was just using the system. So I play it cool. I pretend like I did not think I was already writing COBOL. And this is just a random sample. They actually show me how to access the COBOL code for this mainframe system. And I kind of look through it. I'm like, actually, OK, like this seems all right. Um, it's a little bit dark. I don't know what you can see or not see. But you can see it's similar looking to assembly. But um, you can see there's variables. So you can kind of reason about it. You're like, OK. And the task that they gave me was we just we need to update this field value uh, from this type to another type. Sure, no big deal, because we're doing a data migration. So it was this we need to update to another. So. I should have known something was up because the other mainframe engineers were all like peeking their heads over like, oh, this is interesting. We're going to have her actually go do something. And they kind of give me that task and I work through it and I'm reading. And, um, you know, I really underestimated how long in a terminal you can be scrolling because there's not much of like a UI to tell you how long the files are. But eventually I'm like, okay, I see, I see where this field structure is and I, I kind of see how you update it. So I would go update it here. Um, and it was at that point that I realized it was like a total joke to give that task to me because they were then like, yeah, that, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You definitely cannot. Because if you update it here, you're only updating this parent value. And in fact, there's all these other values of these like children representations of that field that you need to make sure are correct. And if you miss any of them, your data migration is going to fail. So they were actually attempting to teach me <laughs> why their job was hard and why they were frustrated. And it mostly worked. And then I was like, well, well, now I know what COBOL is, apparently, after a while. But what I want to bring up, the last point I want about mainframe merges, is it's not that they are impossible. It's not that you can't do it. But it's very, very, you need to be very serious about how you're going to take this activity when you go into it. Uh, this is a fantastic, it's not a long read, something by an airline mainframe company that's an expert. Uh, and it really digs into like, okay, this is what you're gonna, this is what you're gonna run into if you're trying to merge data. And so their comment here, <laughs> the migrating the required data out is not even remotely similar to migrating data out of any other database system. They do a really good job of being to the point, uh, and that's what engineers who have not experienced mainframe systems will chronically underestimate. Uh, so a couple points here that I'll bring up briefly. But just kind of useful if you ever run into this. And if you're ever thinking about not even mainframes, legacy system merges, uh, you need to very much understand the database structure. And so mainframes, they do not have um, references. There's no like primary keys. There's nothing like that tracking data. If you have a parent-child relationship and you change the parent field, the child's not updated. If you change the child, parent's not updated. The other children are not updated. It's just all a reference. And then there's something called cop COBOL copybooks 
that uh, if you do not have access to that copybook when you're trying to run and compile and run uh, evaluations of the data, you're going to migrate and it's not going to be correct. It's not going to have the right representations. Uh, and th this is all, I just remember them, these mainframe engineers like saying these words over and over. So if you want to check it out, uh, this, this uh, blog post is just fantastic. But this really articulates how difficult it can be to migrate mainframe skip. So I have this experience. I'm now actually a COBOL programmer in some form. And what do you do? Oh, sorry, this got a little messed up. But what do you do when you see something like this? You see this merging. You see it's not, it's not going anywhere fast. <laughs> I was trying to learn COBOL. I was trying to learn MUMS. And then I was like, I need to get out of this. This is like not the life for me. So naturally, any person in this role moves into somewhere where maybe you could try something new. So I immediately run into the Capital One Labs, and they are just absolutely wonderful, really like tolerated my intensity, and was like, we gotta, we gotta restart. We gotta, we gotta build another mainframe. This is insane. You wouldn't believe the horrors that I have witnessed. I've since learned it wasn't as bad as I thought, but coming into here, I was like, this is insane. And so I go to this lab group, and it's like, we got we to gotta fix this. And somehow, there's a group of us in engineering that are like, Let, let's, <laughs> we can do this. Let's go build a new mainframe, um, which was bold, which was just an incredible, just incredible. So we start. We actually go through, and we're like, we're going we're gonna to try to reason about how hard can it be. We're going to try to do accounting for your, like, credit cards and your bank card. That's not, that's not that bad. Uh, two, two things were important. So first, I love this XKCD. It has just like um, really stuck with me and like helps me when I'm, when I'm trying something new and being like, I'm going to be the one that's going to fix this problem. This XKCD helps me a lot. So two things happened when we did it. One, were we really solving the problem of like narrowing down the scope of uh, backend systems and banking? or were we contributing to just one more system? But two, we had two, two pretty big assumptions that we were wrong about. One, the business logic is reasonably complex. We, uh, we built like a team, a small team of just engineers. We didn't even have a business person. We were like, we'll figure it out, no big deal. It's a little bit of a bigger deal than we uh, assumed. And then second, the, there's a lot of different problems around like you need to understand um, all of this data really, really well. And eventually, I was just talking with a coworker that I worked with about this, and he reminded me we found a like 20 to 30 page, like master document from somebody that had been working in mainframes for a long time, and it was essentially just like a 20 page warning label of like, are you really sure you want to do this? Because everybody's tried, and everybody brings this up, and um, this post is one of like is it's just incredible. Um, around how they've tracked just from last year, 74% of organizations fail to complete their legacy system modernization efforts. Do they need to all fail? Absolutely not. This post, I did include a piece of it just like really roast like um, leadership teams, like executives, which I found fun. I don't think that's the only reason though. I think there's um, chronically underestimating how challenging it is to ensure that you fully understand a legacy system before you try to replace it and um, just not understanding all of the resiliency that was built up over time. So often when you're in a situation like this, if you don't want to fail, there's a couple of things that you really want to pay attention to. So these are my biggest learnings. These are my biggest takeaways, both from attempting to merge mainframes and attempting to build another. The, the first piece is they are really fast. So if you want to build something that's even going to keep up with mainframes, you do in fact need to be really thoughtful both about how you're going to scale your code and how you're going to scale your architecture. Because they are fast and they don't generally fail. We've been seeing some more issues across the industry, but for the most part, they're very, very stable. They're always going to give you your answer, um, and you're just going to keep running with them. The second is this like relational way of recreating data structures. Both second and third is this really um, big surprise kind of to me around how yes, the business logic is kind of interesting, whether it's banking and you're making accounting, or maybe it's airlines whatever it might be, that part is interesting. And that tends to be where you're like, oh, I want to understand how this works. In reality, you need to invest a ton of time into making sure that what you're pulling from another system or what you're creating is actually going to be right all of the time. And then the fourth has been a longer learning. I didn't quite figure this out until later recently, really, 
is that uh, we can, I can talk a lot about code quality. And as an industry, we tend to be like, oh, this is where we got to, you know, idiomatic go. Some of my favorite conversations that I overheard was them talking about idiomatic COBOL. And I was like, what? <laughs> and that's like absolutely a conversation they would have, like where you have hard-coded variables. Absolutely. And that is important. But in reality, if you are building your system in such a way where you are just unlikely to make bugs, you are unlikely to introduce something that's going to reduce resiliency, that's something that's going to last for a very, very long time. Not to say that you can, the, the biggest challenge with these legacy systems is adding more features. But if you think about the fact that they truly, I worked on programs running on the mainframe that no joke were actually written in 1971. 71. And like that code was still there. Uh, and you didn't touch it. Because if you did, like everything, <laughs> it was like, that's, it's there. But when you think about, I want to write code that's around for a long time. And, you know, 20 years, that'd be a delight to know that my code is something a person's like cursing out. <laughs> because that means it worked. That means that it provided a lot of value and was hard to get to that same scale. So that's kind of where I got after uh, like three ish, three, four years. I don't know. Now, the next phase, quote unquote, that I've got here, this is a common strategy uh, when at a corporate level and also for people dealing with legacy systems is you've done this enough. And I was like, I, this is a nightmare. <laughs> I don't like this job. So I kind of, I stop. I'm like, I, no. So I'm like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm going to go work on all these other projects. And so I start moving around. I'm building like, I'm back in labs doing like newer ideas. I do some security work. I do uh, web layers of like middleware, stuff like that. Anything. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to do mainframes. <laughs> that is until three years ago, somebody approaches me. Now, the organization that had been attempting to merge those mainframes back when I started, I left. I was like, well, I can't help you guys. This is way out of my <laughs> depth. Uh, they kept going, obviously. And they were observing the challenges that they were seeing. And so they started to say, well, what can we do what else can we do? Do we have to merge mainframe one and two? Do we have to get the data together? They have actually almost entirely completed the merge, but they realized correctly in that process how hard it is. It's not something you can easily underestimate. Uh, or actually, you can very easily underestimate it, but you shouldn't. So they start looking at this um, oversimplified pattern that I've got here around, well, what if we create a communication layer and instead of trying to change the mainframes, or instead of even trying to replace them, what we're going to do is we're going to start building pathways to talk across all these different mainframes. And we're going to make translations between them completely transparent. So if you have any systems that need to call an account that exists on one mainframe or an account that exists on another mainframe, they don't care. They're just like, That's, you figure that out. That's for the communication layer. I just need you to get me the account information from whatever mainframe it's in. And this design was brought up to me. And it was one of those, I was like, well, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to stay away from this. I'm like not sure there was like the split of like, do I want to? I want to, but where do I fall? And in my head, I was like, well, it, it, that sounds not bad. <laughs> that sounds like it could help. It sounds like it could kind of work. And then the person at the time said, well, I know you really like Go. Uh, so if you do this, you know, we'll build all the systems and go. And frankly, the idea could have been bad, and I probably would have been like, <laughs> this sounds great. Uh, so just to give some context before I move into the go section here, is I went through, partially based on this mainframe experience, I first was introduced to Go while evaluating what, what language do we want to write this bank in a box that we were creating back in the day. And I had such a delightful experience creating my first APIs in Go that I just like, anybody that knew me from like, I don't know, 2015 to 2017, 2018, there I was always ready. Do you want to talk about what the best language is? Do you want to have a conversation about this language versus that language? Absolutely. I was all the time very, very into it. So um, essentially, up until the pandemic, I would I used to travel around, and in fact, I like actually brought physically with me this like really embarrassing uh, laptop that I've got, where I thought that because they were white, I could like add all these gophers and it would be very subtle. And about halfway through, I was like, this is not 
subtle. This is not as subtle <laughs> as I thought. And it did help me realize that I needed to like calm down a little bit on the language. But for years, this laptop just died. I would walk around and everybody would be like, you seem to really like the language. And it was true. But that's where I was like, okay, if you're, if you're gonna let me write in Go, I have been writing some systems in Go at Capital One, but they were internal tooling or they were proof of concepts that weren't going anywhere. There were some teams, very small, but like there were a couple of systems that had gone to production and go, and I was I was dying to get that opportunity. So I say yes, absolutely, that's fantastic. And I have this whole vision of how we're gonna go about this. Like, oh, I've been doing this mainframe stuff. I've seen all these ways that you think it's gonna be easy and it's not. So we're gonna do this right. We're gonna we're gonna have all these trainings. We're gonna really talk about design. We're gonna talk about our data. We're gonna like have all this like great conversation about what we're trying to do, how we're gonna do it. All the engineers are gonna have like everything they need to like feel really good about their code. And that definitely did not happen. Like not very little of that happened in reality. And I felt a lot of stress for a long period of time, a lot of kind of guilt. Like I did a couple of trainings and then it was like, what? Uh, I feel like I should be doing more. So the surprise for me is actually I'm gonna like, I'm just gonna step, uh, no, I'll, I'll keep going. So the surprise for me is I've got a couple skills in here that I learned based on this experience that are not what I would have expected to do, where I would have thought like, we've got to write really strong code immediately, or we are going to have all sorts of bugs, we're going to have all sorts of like concerns when we're launching, we're just going to become mainframe 2.0. And in reality, what I saw was after about a year, we launched and I had to have a, like a moment of reflection <laughs> that was essentially like, everything's fine, like it, it works. Like we, we found some issues in Nonprod. the code was fine Go code, it was not like, I wasn't gonna you know, advertise it, but it was totally fine and the system was scaling, the system was working, in fact it was, it was working pretty well. So a lot of this talk is around, uh, I'm gonna just show you a little bit more of what I'm gonna cover, what I would have found the most helpful, some kinda did when I was starting, but what would have been the most valuable to seed across teams, uh, especially if you are working in some sort of like legacy type environment where you're building something new, but you needed to work across specs that you may or may not fully understand. And uh, with an assumption that you probably don't have a full squad of go teams that are just like ready to go, a bunch of experience. Because there's not, we aren't a high enough uh, volume of engineers, so you're most likely gonna have people coming from different backgrounds. So these four steps should hopefully help if you're in this situation or you want to be in this situation like me where I was just, I was begging for that Go project to work on. This should help you see what you wanna invest your time in, whether you're like a lead IC like I am or you're a director or you're a senior, like a principal engineer. These are the things that I at least noticed that have been the most helpful um, or where people just would get the most confused. So the first step, is actually evaluating what the backgrounds are of everybody across your team. So this is not an exact, I didn't really go through and like count every person, but this is very close to accurate of the number of people with prior professional Go experience <laughs> compared to those that didn't. Uh, now they were, they had professional experience in other languages, but the volume was so low. So that's where like I joined at the very beginning and that's where I just assumed like if it's me, <laughs> and there's nobody else. I was like, we're, we're, that's not a good sign. I don't feel great about this. And I was like, well, then we're, we're kind of in trouble. We're going to need to like really fix up a lot of our code. And we've added some more people with Go experience. We're actually getting more now, which is fantastic and definitely going to help with writing better code and like the, the nicer idiomatic Go code. But we have just had very few um, incidents, outages, bugs that probably would surprise you. And I'll walk through some of the areas to avoid, but just actually really speak to Go being such a strong language for learning, for teams that are learning. Where if you are hiring people who have prior engineering experience, even you know like just out of college, or even if they're newer, uh, you're gonna see that they look at it and say, I, I see what I can do with this. And uh, that's what we found. So I have a couple of notes on here. It's a little bit about like different languages and so people might disagree. But this is what I saw 
trip up engineers the most when they came in from different backgrounds. So if they came in from Java, we have a lot of Java engineers, but also C Sharp a bit, where they immediately start going is they look at your system and your problem statement and they start building a bunch of interfaces. They're like, okay, so you want to connect to a database, so you're going to need like this whole section of interfaces, then you're going to have your getters, and then you're going to have like updating your data, okay, okay. And then they start building a bunch of packages and they start having a bunch of files that are in all these different packages. And that's where they start going. They're making like their little web. And it's similar to Java, but you'll see that it kind of spreads out. And then all of a sudden, you're like, so where is that code? <laughs> and that's where, that's where they focus. Um, and now in Python and JavaScript, where I've seen it took me a bit to realize that's what was kind of happening, they would uh, get very, they would say, oh, I like this speed. This is cool. I, I, that's nice. It is faster than what I was using before. But they would say, they would say like, oh, what do you mean? I'm going to write out all the fields? and like their data types, <laughs> and they're all like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, and they just are like, mm. I know we're talking about generics and they will be helpful, but I, I would see consistently people with Python and JavaScript backgrounds be like, I don't, I don't like the sound of this. This is going to take forever. And then Ruby and functional programmers had a, generally had a hard time with both interfaces. They'd want a bunch of interfaces and they would want few validations of their data. Um, and then everybody, no matter what your background, frankly, even if you've been writing Go, everybody um, really focuses on writing libraries in different forms. Everybody has like a new idea of how they can make a library uh, because Go doesn't have like the sheer volume of libraries in other languages. So you immediately have that like, I'll go build one. And everybody wants to add concurrency. So what I'm going to do for the next couple sections is walk through where I saw these people, whether they actually came from this background or just would get stuck. But these are the places where I would see programmers kind of deviate from idiomatic Go and start doing their own kind of setups. And uh, it was frustrating at first to watch and feel like, oh, this is, this is not great. And then it was actually really validating to realize it's not that big of a problem. We can pull back. We can refactor. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what you can hopefully train on if you're in a similar situation. But before I dig in, I really want to bring up um, back to Grace Hopper with the mainframe. If people, I don't know if people caught this, but she's the one sitting next to Howard on this picture. And a lot of people know her. She's reasonably famous. Uh, was Technically did not create COBOL. She created a theoretical language before, but was the advisor for COBOL and was heavily guiding on uh, write something that humans can read, make this readable. And I found at one point a quote. I should have looked for it. But uh, I loved it. It was like a really serious quote of, why would anybody want to write in COBOL? They can just write in assembly. Like, what? Who needs that? This is, they're not real engineers. If you're a real engineer, you're going to write in assembly. And you can see it a lot in programming. So then it became COBOL and C. Why are you writing in C? You need, you need a header file? <laughs> Please. Uh, they did need header files, like it's very helpful compared to COBOL. But they would have this debate about like, oh, you shouldn't have that. And then you see it with C in all of these languages today and similar across different languages. And the major point in what I saw when I saw these people with different backgrounds come in to working with Go, uh, wasn't so much that like, oh, you shouldn't do that language. If you're a real engineer, you would use Go. I, I haven't really heard that sentiment. But more that... Um, by using a language that actually is pretty agnostic in experience levels, so you're gonna, you can bring in people with a Java background, you can bring in people with a Python, JavaScript, Ruby background, and they are all going to have things to learn to write great Go code, but it's all reasonably similar and it's all reasonably manageable. It actually means you can start creating these teams with more confidence. You are going to want to make sure you've got a couple people uh, with production Go experience. I would recommend a few more people than what we had in our project, but as long as you've got enough people that can make sure to be guiding, you're going you're gonna to see pretty decent code and you're definitely going to see it's functional. You're not going to see like issues of bugs of like it's broken. Uh, so this is like, I just love that Grace Hopper really pushed this whole, like, it's okay. Use whatever language is the best for you and the best for your systems. Um, and I wanted to share that before coming in the last part. So these are some of, besides language background, these are some of the things I kind of look for when I'm working with an engineer to see kind of where their perspective is and where they're coming from and what they're going to be thinking about when they're writing code. Because a lot, all of this is actually really important when you're working with legacy systems or 
next to them or replace whatever. Uh, so there's four kind of things I'm watching. One's area is like, have they been working in production with customers? So have they gone through that exercise of like, all right, you got to be deploying. You have to make sure it actually works. If you do not, <laughs> somebody's gonna somebody's gonna yell. Um, or maybe have they been working in internal systems? Because if you've been working in internal, you tend to have a longer buffer for. Oh, it's okay. We'll just. Um, Try again. <laughs> We're just bothering our own employees. On the flip side, there's this nuance around new development and legacy systems. And if you are trying to modernize anything, both of these skills are incredibly valuable and incredibly useful. And most people are not going to have both. Most of them will have kind of a mix. But when I say legacy systems, that can include uh, maintenance work which is very common. People that have had already established systems and they were contributing features onto it. So it could be a mix, it, this can fall in between, but you could just be saying like, okay, here's your setup, follow this template and you're gonna launch something and you're not gonna get the experience of, okay, I'm telling you to go create something that didn't exist before and the thing that exists right now is frustrating but very functional and your thing also now needs to be not frustrating and functional. And uh, all of those four skills are helpful to kind of see where the engineer is at, see what's going to freak them out, see what's going to make them stressed, and then you can use that to evaluate how you guide them towards strong Go production systems. So the next section. So this is probably my biggest learning that if I could just go back to the start, I would probably just start on these couple topics, pro frankly even just the top two. Maybe, probably the third, probably all three. But either way, what I would go through in like a minimum viable training course, and what I mean by that is you're trying to give them enough training that they can go be productive. You don't want to give so much training that they're just like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Like, what, that was a lot. <laughs> I feel like I need to go read a textbook. Uh, they should. If they want to read the textbook, it'll be very helpful. But you want to make sure they don't feel like they have to go get like a minor or like a degree and go to be productive. And you also want to watch like how much rework is this going to take later? And is the rework something that we can just release as we're going? Or is the rework something where we're going to need to kind of really step back and say, how do we want this service operating? Worst case, do we need to start over? type conversation. And then the bottom two are probably the most helpful that I saw, where you just kind of want to encourage learning and testing and drafting. Because a lot of times people, engineers, I've felt this, feel a lot of pressure to get it right the first time. And like you, that's not how programming works. You're going to write your code. I, I write my code, to, it's functional, and now I'm going to go refactor it. And what I've found over time as I've gotten more senior is it's not so much that I just like spit out the right code immediately the first time. Sometimes, sure, if I've done it recently. But a lot of times uh, what I've done is I've just gotten faster at going from this is functional to this is, this is idiomatic. This is something that I can explain all the types and stuff like that. So what I've really focused on is encouraging that kind of cycle of iteration. So that's kind of what I would focus on when training a new org. If they don't have a lot of Go experience, I would watch and see where, where I can help them out. Now the first piece. So this is just straight copied from my absolute favorite in the entire world reference for Go. And it is the wiki page for Golang uh, code review comments. I'm going to just throw this out there. I do not know why it's so hard to Google for this page, but if somebody could fix the SEO on it, it would be phenomenal because this is uh, I actually like was looking at it this week. I haven't read it in a minute. I think they've added some more stuff to it, but it's probably like 13 to 15 pages if you print it out. And it just it just hits. All of these comments are very, very valuable. If you go through and read them multiple times, you're going to start learning things about what do we mean about idiomatic go. And you're probably not gonna, if you're coming in cold, you're gonna be like, I, I don't know, like th that's nice. But when you read, when you write code and read it again and write code and read it again and you hear somebody say, oh, you're going to want to do this or that, and go read it again, things will start making sense. So interfaces. This one is the first thing I would focus on. And it was actually, uh, pat myself, it was the thing I did focus on at the start. I was like, wait, whoa, 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 we, gotta, we have to define these interfaces decently between systems. Um, and what this code shows, first of all, love that they put in all caps in a comment, do not do it, hilarious, just incredible, whoever wrote this. But what they're saying here is they're saying, this is common in a lot of languages, definitely common in Java, is when you're making a class, you're going to define an interface that has every single method listed. You're just going to, these are all the methods that you could use. 
And it kind of looks nice. It kind of looks like, it sort of reminds you of like C header files, but it's just a list of things you can do. Uh, and you're like, look, it's like my home page of like, these are all the methods for my interface. Fine. That's actually in no way, shape, or form valuable for the consumer. You just, you just, why not just make the whole thing public? You just listed all your methods. And what it forces the consumer to do of your package is every time they want to create something that you've defined, they need to define every single method that you listed. And it's actually very annoying. Uh, and so what Go is bringing up in this section is don't do that. Don't do that. Actually, just, just have your methods as a part of this thing that they've defined. And then at the consumer level, they're going to they're gonna define the interface. So you see that top right section? They just say, hey, this is the interface for Thinger. You're going to call this method thing. Wonderful. Everything is fantastic. And then what you see here, you see consumer.go, consumer.test. What you've allowed the consumer to do here is define their own um, alternative packages that are the same interface as your package, but it only has the methods that they care about. So you have just saved them an incredible amount of time. Say I am writing a system that all I wanted to do is add values into the database. I do not want it to delete. I do not want it to update. I don't want it to do any of those things. I'm going to define a consumer interface that it just only lets you add. And so what that will tell programmers who come in after me is you can't delete even if you want to. Yes, certainly. If you're writing to a database, they all have ways to delete uh, data inside of there. But I don't want you to do that here in this code. And that's what this is getting at. And so when people start to understand this, they start to see some of the freedom in interface design. Uh, and they start to see how they can set up their systems to be very specific and intentional and clear about what they want to be doing at their consumer level. Now, the second thing that I will be bringing up is around typing. So this is the one where programmers come in from uh, untyped languages or things that just sort of let you flip around between all your types. And they say, I'm sorry, what? I just want to save this into the database. I just want to like, I just, I just want to get it in. And uh, there's actually some content from Bill Kennedy that's like incredibly, he, he tends to open his courses with this and have resonated well with me and really resonate with like all the mainframe learnings from earlier around uh, the entire job of software engineering, generally speaking, is taking data from one location, transforming it, and saving it somewhere else or getting it to another person. Like that's, that's kind of the job. And a lot of times when you start saying, I'm just going to I'm just going to throw the data around. What you end up with is very much like a mainframe type scenario where you have all these references to data and you have no idea what's going to be used where. So, um, the thing to think about that I've seen kind of calm down engineers when they're in this situation is to not think of it as a massive list of fields that you need to like all of them are different, they're all unique, you're really like, oh Jesus, this is frustrating. And think of it more like this is a JSON representation. In many cases, that's what we do. Um, there's always so many data types. You can have an int, you can have a string, you can have a Boolean, you can have a collection, but there's only so many things you need to be working with. And breaking your structures down more programmatically tends to help them see that they can actually work through definitions quickly. Um, get all these validations going and feel very confident that their data is really uh, correct and safe at the end of the day. So, oh man, I got a bunch to talk about. All right, I'm going to like speed through a couple of these slides. The last thing I'm going to bring up is uh, library development. I'm just going to bring in this section. Um, a piece that comes up if you're in a larger company and you do not have well-established Go practices is everybody's going to say, build me the libraries that we've got for Java, that we've got for Python. I need you to just, just make the same libraries. We already got it for Java. We must have it for Go. And on the flip side, newer engineers, they're going to say, I, I need to write this library because um, I'm writing code and you know, nobody else should have to write this code. We'll make a library. And a huge opportunity here, when you're, if you're new, if, you, if you Go is not a well-established language at your company, is to really rely on your senior engineering level to think through how do I learn from the libraries we've created in the past, and how do I ensure that uh, when we create libraries, we're being very diligent to make sure that it's good quality and we've done enough testing in it. So I just encourage relying on those people there. Um, all right, testing and code review. Man, I want to talk about everything for a very long time. I'll speed through this. 
This is a cool one. This just talks about systematics. This is the mainframe system that I worked on. Uh, again, it's a program that's installed on these mainframes. And this is from a couple years ago, but like it's, it's still in use today. It's, it's pretty popular. One thing when I worked with these systematics engineers that they would talk about was when they were creating this. Like they worked at, some of them worked at this company back in like the 90s and 80s. They said the quality of code, the care that everybody put into it, uh, into the system back then was so high that uh, there was never a doubt that everybody, every engineer really understood what they were building and why the data needed to look a certain way. And that's what built something that lasted for so long. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of the things that are really, really valuable in breaking down testing. We will probably reference it throughout this conference, but testing tables, fantastic, really, really helpful. Defining your testing tables to look like the function definitions that you're calling is actually really helpful. So thinking about it like you've got your input and your output to whether it's a function, whether it's a handler, you want to define your testing table to look a lot like the function you're calling. Uh, that tends to simplify things and make it really clear for input and output and validations. And I've seen programmers build tests a lot more quickly with that. Now the last part though is a really good sign. You want to like a smell kind of. Is your, and I've done this. You're building test tables. They're getting pretty long. Now you're trying to build like you're trying to do data validations. You're trying to check if your dependencies are working. You're trying to check if um, your business logic is working. That tends to mean that you want to split up that function. And it's a great way to start writing more idiomatic Go code is to see when your testing tables are like trying to test a bunch of things at once. And if that's happening, see where you can split things out, see where you can simplify uh, and, and, sh and shrink down the scope of a function. It's a really good place to look for. The last thing I'm going to bring up about testing and code review, so I, I would personally, I just consider this like the poor person's code review. So you've got a, a ton of code reviews that you want to do. You'd love to do all of them. You know you can't. What are you going to check for that's most impactful? Uh, I tend to do like, I'll, I'll kind of line up like 15 minute reviews to see like if I could just check through and, see, and notice anything, uh, whether it's actually a bug or just like you consider this or that. Uh, these are the things that I'm looking for in order. And I'm going to just move to the next slide. What's nice about this is you can actually kind of split a lot of times you have two code reviewers. If you are, I tend to work with engineering managers, and what we'll try to do is have the engineering manager more focused on the use cases and saying, have you tested all of the ways that our system could actually be used? I'm more focused on the code quality. We're both looking for both, but it makes it in a way where we've got two eyes and we're kind of specializing on different areas and it makes the code review less overwhelming and faster to do. You can do this with anybody, but I have found this to just having a checklist of the minimum stuff I'm going to look for be really helpful. Now, finally, I'm just going to show a couple of pieces of what we've built and I'll just kind of end on where we've gone. So this got formatted when I changed to Keynote weirdly, but this is what we are actually building. So when I talk about mainframe scale, you have to get all these daily updates for every single account that's gone through, every single transaction. Uh, we do not have incredibly high volumes of traffic going through 24-7 yet. It's going to get higher over time, but it's still not overwhelming. The interesting part about banking, as you guys know, you spend your money and then you are in like a, it's like in process and pending. And then the next day it updates to be, it's good. What's happening there is you're going through the Federal Reserve, you're checking if like money transferred between all these people. So what we get is essentially like this big dump of all the updates. Like, okay, we've processed, update everything now. And what we want to do is do it as quickly as you can. So we see, um, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to skip towards the end. Actually, I don't have it on there. So we've seen up to about like five gigabytes per second come through every day that we're trying to process as quickly as we can to update all of our systems. And that creates this interesting load that we've got to handle. And the piece that I will end on, <laughs> I guess, is uh, I fully expected when building this system that at some point I was going to need to like slow down the team and be like, OK, I need a couple days. We're going to need to refactor and add in some concurrency because at some point we're not going to scale. And to my like, disappointment, that didn't happen. We actually just scaled. And in fact, where we saw issues had nothing to do with our code code, and it had a lot to do with our infrastructure. They are not bad issues, but it had to do with, like, <laughs> we're going to slam you with a bunch of data. So the load balancers actually have a certain level of capacity that uh, they allocate. And if you start, this is our traffic pattern. So you can kind of see we've got some real-time data going through. 
reasonable volume. And then we've got every single update that's coming for every single account across Capital One. And what you see is like, OK, here's everything happening. And uh, learn some cool tricks around how to scale the load balancer. Not particularly hard. But you need to do it. You're going to see that at your database level. You're also going to see what we've found is we've seen it when dealing with other people's systems like in the company way more than our own which is kind of disappointing when you're like, oh, I really wanted to like go through and add this. Uh, but also really fantastic from a language standpoint that you do, you often don't have to add concurrency. You will sometimes, but you tend to not. Uh, and my tip here, though, is if you do not have advanced performance testing systems, that's actually a very fun, you'll probably want concurrency built in there, um, thing that you can build that will be really, really valuable and help you out. So the final thing I want to bring up is, um, this is sometimes what our traffic patterns look like. So we'll just kind of see tons of requests. And the request volumes themselves are not that high, but the volume of data coming through can be incredibly large. And I remember pulling up production and seeing that this was our traffic pattern and being like, oh no, like this, what was this? And the like uh, pause to realize that like actually everything was perfectly fine. Didn't matter. We, we were, nobody was getting alerted to anything. This was just like absolutely what we can scale to. It was really comforting. And at this point in time, over the last like year-ish, uh, we've gotten over 33 million requests. And we've processed, um, I was hoping we were at the petabyte scale, only at 841 terabytes of data, but we're getting pretty close. And that's just what we've been running so far in this system, all written in Go. And the last uh, bigger thing I wanted to bring up is we did, in fact, shut down one of our mainframes back in June, which was like my personal, like I was real excited to do it. There's a bunch more to do. But just based on um, scaling up the systems, writing them all through, had a lot of success. OK, so the last tiny, tiny things I'm just going to mention. First, really quickly, I really want to say hi to my mom. Uh, she's watching this. She's not an engineer. But she's actually got really sick over the last month. And she's watching this from a hospital where she just had chemo treatment this week. So I want to say hi to her. And if anybody's watching and you want to just say, like, hi, mom, I think she would really appreciate it. She was so excited. She kept saying, like, you got to do this. You can still go through with all of it. And she, I think she's just loving seeing everything that we're doing in engineering. Uh, you can say hi, mom, to my mom or your mom, whoever's around. Uh, and I, but the final couple updates is we were talking about this last night, and I was like, I'm pretty sure you can write Go on mainframes. If you can't, you could. It's just not supported. And I went and looked, and like for sure, we could definitely be writing Go systems um, on IBM's mainframes today. So just throwing that out there for anybody who wants to do that, I would be interested. And in fact, next September. There's like a actually pretty legit looking conference in Philly. So if you are interested in these like mainframe modernization <laughs> efforts, it's alive. There's a lot of people engaged. Uh, and I'm so excited and happy to be here. I hope uh, this was helpful for some of you. And uh, if you have questions, if you have ideas, if you just want to talk about legacy development, I would be thrilled to. And I will just end on this final one of my favorite quotes from Grace Hopper, where uh, they said, you know, computers would only do arithmetic. That's what they said when they launched mainframes, like we're just going to use it for math. And she really looked at that and said, I think we can do a lot more here, which I find fun and I hope happens for a lot of you in your careers. But that's everything. Thank you. And I will hopefully see you guys all on Discord.